Imagine this. You're aboard the most advanced spaceship humanity has ever built. The countdown begins. Engines roar. Your body presses into the seat as acceleration surges through your bones. Outside the stars stretch into streaks of light. You're going faster and faster, closer to the ultimate cosmic dream, outrunning light itself. But here's the truth. You will never make it. No matter how powerful the engines, no matter how clever the design, no matter how much fuel we pour into the tanks, if you have mass, the universe itself forbids you from ever reaching the speed of light. Physicist Brian Cox once put it bluntly in an interview, If you have mass, you will never travel at the speed of light. That's not a technological limitation, it's not a matter of building better engines, it's a fundamental law of physics. Tonight we're diving deep into that wall. We're going to explore why light speed is the ultimate cosmic limit, why Einstein's theory of relativity makes it unavoidable, and why Brian Cox insists that no amount of human genius will ever break through it. This isn't just about rockets and spaceships, it's about the very structure of the universe itself, why the speed of light is so special. The number itself, 299,792 kilometers per second, doesn't sound personal, it's just a figure. But the speed of light is not just fast, it's not just impressive, it's the cornerstone of the universe. Think about this, in the time it takes you to blink, light has traveled thousands of kilometers. In just one second it can circle Earth seven times, sunlight takes only eight minutes to cross the 150 million kilometers from the sun to our planet. That means every time you look at the sun, you're looking into the past, eight minutes into history. But the real magic of light speed is not just its quickness, it's its universality. No matter where you are in the universe, no matter how fast you're moving, if you measure the speed of light, you'll always get the same answer, 299,792 kilometers per second. This constancy is what shook physics to its core at the start of the 20th century. Albert Einstein built his theory of relativity on this strange fact. He realized that if light speed never changes, then something else must give way, space and time themselves. Einstein's Revolutionary Insight Before Einstein people thought of space and time as absolute, like a stage on which the universe plays out, the stage is fixed, unchanging, while the actors, planets, stars, people, move around on it. Einstein shattered that view. He showed that space and time are not fixed but flexible. They bend, they stretch, they even fuse together into what we now call space-time. And at the heart of this revelation lies the speed of light. Einstein's special theory of relativity told us, as you move faster time itself slows down relative to others, distances contract along the direction of travel, mass effectively increases as speed climbs. Einstein's famous equation E equals sine mc2 is another way of saying the same thing, mass and energy are interchangeable. When you accelerate an object, you pump energy into it, but the closer you get to light speed, the more energy goes not into making it faster, but into increasing its mass. The object becomes heavier and heavier, resisting acceleration until the required energy to go faster becomes infinite. That is the wall, the ultimate stop sign. This is exactly where Brian Cox enters the picture. Known for his ability to translate abstract physics into something poetic and understandable, Cox has explained countless times that this is not just a matter of rockets being too slow, it's deeper than that. In a BBC lecture, he once described it with almost childlike clarity. The faster you go, the harder it gets. Not because you're running out of fuel, but because the universe itself is saying no. Your mass increases. Your energy needs explode. And as you get closer and closer to the speed of light, the energy you need goes to infinity. Infinity is not a big number. It's impossible. This explanation cuts through decades of science fiction dreams. It's not a problem of imagination. It's not like saying we can't build a ladder to the moon before rockets existed. It's a problem of laws, of nature itself and Cox emphasizes this point. It's not engineering, it's not technology. If you have mass, you cannot travel at the speed of light. That's the end of the story.
but as he often adds, it's also the beginning of the most fascinating consequences imaginable. The Strange Consequences of Near Light Speed Let's suppose you accept that you can't actually hit light speed but you wonder, what if I get close? 90%? 99%? 99.999%? .99 what happens then? This is where relativity becomes mind-bending, time dilation. Imagine an astronaut traveling at 99.9% .9 the speed of light. For them, time ticks normally. Their heartbeat, their speech, their meals, it all feels regular. But for us, watching from Earth, their clock ticks slower. A journey that feels like a few years to them could mean centuries passing on Earth. They'd be like time travelers skipping forward into the future. Length contraction. At those speeds, the universe itself seems to shrink. Distances in the direction of travel contract. To them, the galaxy collapses inward energy explosion. But here's the rub. To push closer and closer to light speed the energy requirement skyrockets. To go from 90% to 99% takes far more energy than all human civilization has ever produced. To push from 99% to 99.9%, .9 even more. Brian Cox loves to highlight this paradox. It's not that relativity is cruel, it's that it's elegant. Relativity gives you time travel, he says. It gives you the ability to skip into the future. It gives you the most astonishing predictions, but it always keeps the speed of light just out of reach. Always. Evidence from Everyday Physics You might wonder, all of this sounds like theory, but is it real? Do we see these effects? The answer is yes, every single day. Muons in the atmosphere When cosmic rays hit our atmosphere they create tiny particles called muons. These particles decay extremely quickly, in a fraction of a second. By the rules of normal physics, they shouldn't make it to the ground. But they do. Why? Because they're traveling so close to the speed of light that time for them slows down. Their lifetime stretches, and they survive long enough to be detected at the surface. Relativity in action. GPS satellites, the Large Hadron Collider. The uh... GPS satellites. Every time you use Google Maps, you're depending on relativity. GPS satellites orbit Earth at high speeds, and their clocks tick differently from ours on the ground. Without corrections from Einstein's relativity, GPS would drift kilometers off within a single day. The Large Hadron Collider at CERN, protons are accelerated to 99.999999% the speed of light. As they're pushed closer to light speed, they resist more and more. Engineers pour colossal amounts of energy into them, but their actual speed barely increases. Instead, their effective mass shoots up. This is exactly what Einstein predicted, and what Brian Cox often points to as evidence that the barrier is absolute. Perspective from Brian Cox Cox has a talent for turning this into poetry. In interviews, he doesn't just say, it's impossible. He says, that's the beauty of it. The universe gives us rules, and those rules are the reason things exist at all. They are the poetry of reality. For him, the fact that we cannot reach light speed isn't depressing, it's inspiring. It means the laws of nature are consistent, universal, unbreakable. That's what makes science possible. The deeper physics, mass, energy, and the cosmic wall. So far we've talked about the speed of light as a barrier. But let's go deeper. Why exactly is this limit so absolute? Why can't we just push harder, add more fuel, build a stronger engine? At everyday speeds, cars, airplanes, even rockets, Newton's laws work fine. You add energy, you go faster, simple. But as speeds climb closer to light speed, relativity takes over. In plain words, as you get closer to light speed, your energy needs grow without limit. At 10% light speed, the effect is small. At 90%, it's dramatic. At 99.999% comma, it's monstrous. And at 100%, it's infinite. That's why Brian Cox insists it's not an engineering problem. It's baked into the math of the universe. Infinity is not a number you can reach with better technology. Why light gets a free pass. But wait, light itself does travel at light speed, so why can't we? The answer lies in photons, the particles of light. Unlike you and me, photons have no rest mass. They are pure energy. They don't need a push to keep moving. They simply are motion. This is a profound divide in nature. It splits the universe into two categories. The weightless, photons, gluons, may be gravitons if they exist. The weighty, everything else from protons to planets to people. Faster than light versus faster than causality. 
Now here's a subtle but important point, something Cox has explained beautifully. People often imagine faster than light travel as just a matter of speed, like driving your car a little faster. But relativity ties light speed not just to movement but to causality. Causality means the order of cause and effect. If you drop a glass it shatters. Cause then effect. But if you go faster than light that order breaks. You could shatter the glass before dropping it. That's why physicists sometimes reframe the speed of light as the speed of causality. It's not just a speed limit, it's a law of logic. It's what keeps reality coherent. Brian Cox underlines this point. It's not simply that you can't go faster than light, it's that if you could you'd break cause and effect, you'd destroy the possibility of a consistent universe. Science fiction and the human dream warp drives. The Alcubierre drive, proposed in 1994 suggests bending space-time itself. By shrinking space in front of a ship and expanding it behind, you could ride a bubble of warped space at effective faster-than-light speed, locally you never break the light limit. Globally you leap across the galaxy, wormholes, imagine folding space like a sheet of paper and poking a hole through, in principle Einstein's equations allow such tunnels, in practice they're unstable, collapse instantly and need exotic stabilizers, pop culture, from Star Trek's warp drives to Interstellar's wormholes, fiction thrives on breaking this barrier. And perhaps that's not a bad thing. As Cox himself says, science fiction is the imagination of physics, it inspires, even if it doesn't describe reality. The immense energy problem. Let's return to cold hard numbers. How much energy would it take to push even a small object to near light speed? Suppose we want to accelerate a 1000 kg spaceship to 99.9% .9 light speed. The required energy would be roughly 4.5 x 1020 joules, that's about the total energy the entire human civilization produces in a year, multiplied by several thousand. And that's for a tiny ship, not a colony vessel. Brian Cox often brings up the Large Hadron Collider in this context. At CERN, protons are pushed to 99.999999% light speed. The accelerator consumes massive power, but the protons gain only a tiny fraction more speed, most of the energy goes into their increasing mass. The lesson is clear. Even with all our resources we can only push subatomic particles to these speeds. A starship? Forget it. The time traveler's paradox. And yet, relativity does give us one loophole, not to go faster than light but to cheat time. If you travel near light speed, time slows for you. A round trip to a distant star could take a few years for the astronauts, but centuries for people on Earth you'd return to find entire generations gone. Brian Cox often describes this as Einstein's gift. You can't beat light, but you can use it to skip into the future. This is not science fiction, it's measured fact. Muons in the atmosphere, GPS satellites, particle accelerators, they all prove time dilation is real. The philosophical perspective. Now let's step back. What does it mean that there's a wall we can never cross? Should we be disappointed? Brian Cox argues the opposite. He sees beauty in the barrier. The fact that the speed of light is absolute is the reason the universe makes sense. It's the reason we can do science at all. It's the poetry of reality. Practical horizons. So, where does that leave us? If we can't reach light speed what can we aim for? Fractional light speed. Projects like Breakthrough Starshot imagine sending gram-sized probes to nearby stars at 20% light speed using powerful lasers. That's not light speed, but it could reach Proxima Centauri in a few decades. Fusion propulsion. Advanced concepts like fusion drives or antimatter propulsion could reach 5-10% light speed, still vast progress compared to today. Generational ships. If near light speed travel is impossible for crewed ships, maybe the answer is slow voyages where entire generations live and die on board. A human arc through the stars. In all cases the speed of light remains untouchable, but progress within the boundary is still breathtaking. So why will we never reach the speed of light because the universe says so? Because relativity, tested a million times over, declares it impossible. Because if we tried, we'd need infinite energy, and we'd shatter causality itself. Brian Cox said it best. If you have mass, you can never travel at the speed of light. That's the end of the story. And yet, perhaps it's not the end. Perhaps it's just the beginning. Because within those limits, we find wonder. We find time travel. We find inspiration for science and stories alike. The wall we cannot cross is what makes the universe coherent, structured, and beautiful. It's what makes science possible. It's what makes existence itself real. So next time you look up at the stars, remember, they are far.
impossibly far. But they are not unreachable. They call us to push ever closer to the cosmic speed limit. Not to break it, but to dance with it. Because in the end it's not about outrunning light, it's about learning to live, dream, and explore within the poetry of reality.